supporters because it doesn't do you any good to be an actress in the theater if nobody wants to come see you. Um, all of our fine arts education is performance based. All of our fine arts education involves creating, presenting or performing, connecting and responding to art. So it's a very well balanced curriculum that's not just about the creation of artwork. Uh, the arts are very important to social emotional learning. You probably know this if any of you are actively engaged in any kind of art form on your own, whether you sing in a choir or you play an instrument, you know that the feelings that you get when you're creating and you're performing can be very um, stress relieving and very enjoyment producing. Uh, we try to encourage healthy risk taking. We also try to increase their self awareness. We want them to be motivated, creative students. We want them to understand they can be successful regardless of their age and regardless of their ability level. We always meet our students where they are and try to provide growth. So we're not as concerned about everybody making a, a 90 or a 95. We want to we want to get them from point A to the next level and that's always our um, our goal. We teach a lot about cultural awareness, diversity, acceptance and inclusion. We provide a lot of opportunities for collaboration, which is another great work skill. We also provide a really safe place to express emotions and for students to practice their craft. It's very important for students in school to feel like they have a safe place where they can go somewhere, have somebody that they can talk to during the day if they're having a problem. Counselors, of course, are great for that, but we find a lot of time in the fine arts, they show up in our rooms because they feel safe there and they feel like they can trust us. As we go through our programs just a little bit, um, looking at the elementary programs first, all of our elementary schools offer general music and visual art instruction for all students. That's equivalent to about 45 to 50 minutes per week for each of those classes. Some schools may do it a little differently. They may do several weeks of a class and then and switch, but it works out to about the same. Of the 22 elementary fine arts teachers, 20 are music or art certified. Each of these teachers provides instructions for all students weekly. That's approximately 6,400 students total, and the schools range from 459 to 799 students per teacher, depending on the school. And as you're aware, schools earn beyond the core CCRPI points for students who earn passing grades in the fine arts and elementary school, which happens pretty, pretty regularly most of the time because they're not um, too stringent criteria for that. It's more about that creativity and participation. Um, this just shows you what the student population from this is actually from the 80 day count was at those schools and there is a wide variety. There's a there's a wide range of uh, population. So sometimes we do find that some of our schools may be on a slightly longer rotation. So you might a school with 799 students might not be on a five day rotation. They might be on a six or seven day rotation. Smaller schools may have some extra time where different classes can come in and uh, participate in art or music on a varying basis. On to our middle schools, all four middle schools offer band, chorus and visual art. Conyers Middle School also offers guitar. We started that this year and they have uh, three classes of guitar. They've been doing really well with that. As a fine arts specialty school, Davis Middle School also offers photography and videography, orchestra, theater and dance. Uh, our band and chorus programs are still rebuilding since the pandemic, but we are seeing some growth there. We have been teaming our elementary music teachers and our art teachers with uh, Davis Middle School in particular, in particular to encourage students personally to apply to go to Davis and be a part of the Fine Arts Academy. I find that when you when you speak to a child individually and let them know that you think they would be a good candidate for this program, they're a lot more likely to apply than just assuming that they know that they might be a good candidate. Um, we're gonna take be collecting data from all the schools as students make their connection choices in the next few weeks just to sort of 
kind of track them and see how they're choosing and what they're choosing and how we can encourage them to choose something in the fine arts. And these next slides, I won't belabor. I'll just go through them quickly. They just give you a snapshot of where our students are taking classes in the fine arts at each of the middle schools. Um, the, the one thing that I will explain is you have two numbers there. You have enrollment and you have unique students. And they're different because sometimes students have, have more than one fine arts course. So they may be enrolled in chorus and guitar. So they may show up in Mr. Alvarado's uh, unique students or enrollments more than once. Uh, so that is Conyers Middle School and Edwards Middle School. Again, Conyers has chorus and guitar, band, visual art. Edwards has chorus, band, and visual art. Davis, as we already discussed, has a much broader fine arts curriculum and they serve those fine arts academy students. So you see that their numbers uh, are spread out, but you also see the total enrollments there are 2,130 total fine arts enrollments, which is very substantial. 91% of the student body is involved in some fine arts program. And lastly, Memorial Middle School, again, has music appreciation and chorus, band and visual art, and their all, um, enrollments are also very high at Memorial Middle School. So moving to high school, Heritage High School, Rockdale, Salem, all offer band, chorus, theater, and visual art. Uh, Rockdale High School, we're actually adding a guitar program there next year because the students who are currently at Conyers Middle School will need a place to go and not necessarily all want to go to Heritage where we also have a guitar program. So we have, uh, we applied for the guitar program or Rockdale County High School and were accepted into the lead guitar program. And I'll speak just a minute about that program because it really is a unique opportunity for us. We partner with a, a group called Lead Guitar and you can apply to be a part of that group. Some people pay to be a part of that group. We're not paying. We are actually going to be grant funded to be a part of that group for Rockdale Heritage and Conyers for next year. And what happens is we have a doctoral student from the University of Georgia who comes in and teaches those classes one day per week. However many classes they have, most of them have one or two. Uh, Conyers has three, but the doctoral student will come and teach the classes one day a week with the assistance of the teacher of record and the rest of the days that week, the teacher of record will continue the instruction using the resources and the curriculum provided by lead guitar. So it really is quite an advantage to us to have them coming in and uh, serving our students and also helping our teachers to become better guitar teachers. And they also do training in the summer with them to uh, make sure that they fully understand. So they've been really great to work with so far. I think I skipped something. Um, yes, the other thing that we really try to do is we try to encourage our students to continue in a pathway so that they can achieve mastery and also maximize scholarship opportunities. Um, so just like in CTAE, there are pathways in the fine arts, there's a pathway. So taking three courses in any one fine art is going to complete that pathway. And that's going to feed into another thing that we'll talk about in just a minute. So again, this is the same type of information that I just showed you on the middle schools. This is about the high school fine arts programs. It gives you the enrollments and unique students for all of our um, high school. So this one is Rockdale County. Again, 79% of the student body participating in fine arts. Salem, approximately 90% of the student body participating in fine arts. And Heritage, 96%. So I mentioned the pathways a minute ago and the pathways are integral part of our fine arts diploma seal and the fine arts diploma seal is 
received from the Department of Education, and we apply for those on behalf of students who meet the criteria, which our teachers begin working with those students as soon as they come in the ninth grade, they begin working with them to have them meet the criteria to receive the Fine Arts Diploma Seal on their diploma. And the requirements are to complete a Fine Arts Pathway, which is three courses in the same area, have a fourth Fine Arts course, or there are some approved uh, Creative Industries courses. Um, also, uh, Dramatic Writing would count as that fourth course. They need to participate in two extracurricular activities in their discipline. They need 20 hours of community service in their discipline per year. And they present a capstone project in their discipline, which could be an exhibit or it could be a performance. Um, it varies from discipline to discipline. Um, I'm pleased to say that we've grown our numbers from 89 recipients in 2019 to 140 in 2023. And when you look at our numbers on the spreadsheet that the Department of Education shows out, they compare very favorably with some much larger districts who have been spurred to uh, increase their numbers because they know that we're not anywhere as large as them and we have more recipients. So I'm kind of proud of that. We have a lot of performance and exhibition opportunities within Rockdale County Public Schools. You are probably aware of a lot of those because I usually put them in the monthly updates and let you know kind of what's going on. So I'm not going to read through those. Um, we did start our superintendent's holiday card competition couple, last year, and that's been very successful. And it was a lot of fun this year to see multiple winners, and we had a lot more entries this year. There are also a lot of performance and exhibition opportunities outside of Rockdale for our students, and we try to keep them abreast of all of those opportunities. Some of the groups will take advantage of those opportunities as a group. They may go and compete in a band exhibition in the fall. Most of our high schools do that, or they may go to a, um, a performance in another state even. Um, some of them are open for students to investigate on their own. And then there are some that um, they can do through our professional organizations. GMEA provides opportunities for all state and ensemble and solo performances and things like that. The picture that you can't really see very well down there is from the GMEA conference a couple of weeks ago. And that's a, a group called Atlanta Drum Academy, and they are amazing. And they have children as young as probably seven or eight years old, all the way up to high school seniors. And we have one Rockdale County High School percussion student who performs with them. So he was there and they opened the Georgia Music Educators Association Conference this year in Athens, and they were really amazing. So these are a few other of the exhibition opportunities outside of Rockdale. Um, coming up soon will be the Georgia High School Association, the GHSA uh, Literary Meet, theater and choral students participate in that. Uh, congressional art still coming up as well. So lots of opportunities for our students to participate in the arts inside and outside of our, our schools. Uh, Fine Arts also is concerned with professional learning for our teachers to make sure they're up to date and make sure that they have opportunities to learn and to grow in their craft as well. So there are some examples of some of the professional learning offered in the first semester. These are a few pictures from uh, GMEA, the music conference, GAEA, the art conference, and the theater conference. In the bottom left is Terrence Green, and he is presenting a poster session for his doctoral research at GMEA. So that was that was great. We had people from Rockdale present at all of the professional conferences this year, all three of these professional conferences. Uh, as far as the impact of professional learning, it's uh, really important for these teachers to have that content specific professional learning that applies directly to their discipline area instead of something general. It's great for them also to be able to get together with their, their 
other teachers in their area to network and to vertical team. All of those kind of things are facilitated when we have these professional learning days and when we um, are able to go to different professional learning activities and conferences and things like that. In most cases, presentations that they take place in during professional learning are able to be implemented the next day. In fact, a lot of times they call me or email me or send me pictures the next day of, look, I'm doing this in class today. You know, we did it yesterday and now I'm doing it with the kids. So that's a really great to see. So successes and celebrations, I'll go through a few of these. Uh, I kind of just talked about the participation in the conferences, so I won't go through that, but it's uh, been great to see those teachers have those experiences this year. All of our schools are on track for LGPE adjudication, all of our middle and high schools. Some group from each of those will be going uh, to LGPE in March. Uh, we also have the Youth Art Month show and the photo show coming up. I've already talked about the lead guitar programs, so I think that's okay. Uh, I will say another highlight of Georgia Music Educator Association Conference was that we do a job fair, the, the fine arts coordinators from across the state, we do a job fair on Friday of that conference. And I was able to uh, get information from about 36 music educators who said they would be interested in coming to Rockdale should there be an opening. So it's really nice to have that when you do have openings, you've already got resumes, you've already got contact information. So that was very helpful. Um, we've had a lot of students take part in honor bands and choruses, and I'll be giving you some more information about that in your next board update of names and, and places there in school. And I wanted to update this, that we have six fine arts students who are going on to the in-person interviews for GHP. So that's great. We have two music, two art, and two theater. I don't know if they meant to make it even, but it was nice that they did. <laughs> so um, last slide is... For me, as always, upcoming events, this is not even all of them. This is basically just February. Um, on Saturday, if you're not too busy and it's not raining too hard, we have the elementary honor chorus that will be performing at Davis Middle School. And Mr. Jay Sessoms is the clinician, and that'll be at 2.30, and it will be very short. Um, Rockdale County High School's jazz band is also performing in a benefit on Saturday night at Newton County High School at six o'clock. And then I'll leave you to the rest of them, but those are very, the most immediate ones. And that ends my presentation. I'm happy to take questions if you have them. I have a question, lots of great information, right? And just as you noted, um, the arts have many positive impacts on social and emotional learning. Uh, with that being said, and I actually wrote this question before the young lady came up with the comment, how are our learning support students being serviced or have access to the fine arts curriculum, the ones who are self-contained? So our, in the elementary schools, the self-contained classes actually do go to fine arts classes. And I actually just asked that question myself because I was filling out a, an application for a, um, best communities for music education award kind of thing. Uh, and that was one of the questions is, are, are those students served? And they are. Now, I would say in the, in the in middle and high school, I don't know that you're going to see a self-contained class, the entire class coming to a special, but there is great inclusion uh, in, in the arts of students who are interested. Okay. Thank you. And my second question, in middle and high school, um, when they get, they get to choose their connections and their electives, are there fees associated with them being a part of the fine arts programs? Like, are they paying for stuff? I would say generally, no. I do know that sometimes there are band fees associated with particularly marching band and extracurricular activities like that. Um, and I, I can't speak completely to the fine arts academies on whether or not they pay a fee to be a part of that fine arts academy. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, that was kind of going to lead into my next question. Like if there are fees and there are students who are interested in participating, 
are, are there like local funds at a local school or something that would help um, offset some of the costs for those children who want to participate? Sure, absolutely. We're never going to turn a student away. If there's a student who wants to be in the band, mm -hmm. uh, as you probably know, we provide instruments for a lot of the students. Uh, some students buy instruments, some students rent instruments, some students we provide the instruments. My own son played the uh, barito baritone and the tuba, so or euphonium, and uh, those are really expensive. So I never bought one. I didn't. He wasn't in school here, but I never had to buy one. But I was blessed to be able to borrow one from the school for a nominal fee. But if the students or the family can't afford that, then we'll we'll find a way to make it happen. Thank you. Again, lots of great information. OK, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, so if you have an old uh, trumpet you haven't played in a couple of years and you want to donate it, we'll take it and see if we can refurbish it and use it. We have had a lot of people donate things in the past. Oh. OK, you could. We can maybe outfit a whole band. <laughs> um, thank you, um, um, Dr. Means. Great information. I have a question. You mentioned something about scholarships. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an advocate for the arts. So do we track our students and how many are actually getting scholarships and going on to college, especially those who get the fine arts seals? I'm really glad you asked that because I forgot I failed to, to tell you something that I meant to tell you. Um, we we have not tracked that data like I want to. So I will be sending a survey out to all of the teachers this year to get a better idea of exactly how many performances, how many students perform how many times each year, how many students participate in how many shows and exhibit art how many times per year, and how many students receive scholarships um, and what that total amount is. But one thing that I, I will tell you is that Mr. James at Salem High School always or always is relative because I've only been here a couple of years, but makes sure that every band student, every graduating band student has a scholarship, at least one to some university. So um, they they do that every year. And I was actually at the Rockdale County High School one of their fall performances and one of the recruiters from a college, I think it's in Ohio, was there and said that he was he was making that known right then as well. And he told the parents, he said, if you students can come see me, parents can come see me afterwards and I will give you the letter right now that says if you want to come to our school, you can come. And it was a full ride for four years. And if they didn't happen to graduate in four years, then they would extend it beyond that time. So they're pretty substantial. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Oates, board members. I'm Kimberly Back here to represent Human Resources. So good news is that on is currently we have no certified vacancies posted. So um, as you all know, that could change tonight. But as of uh, the 31st, when I pulled this information, we had no current vacancies open. Now it is. Thank you. It's amazing what happens when you turn it on. Um, but we are we have already started posting our vacancies for the 24-25 school year. And you can see those vacancies there. Um, the vacancies reflect the conversations with staff that principals are having who may be moving, retiring, or leaving for a lot of different reasons. Uh, and those are just the ones that we currently know about. 
And anytime you start talking about staffing and postings and teachers, you also have to include in that student enrollment. So I did go ahead and include a slide on our current 100 day student enrollment count, just so you would know what that is. But please also note that the full enrollment information are in your board folders if you'd like to go back and look at 2060 8100. But I also wanted to, to show you the 100 day count because I also wanted to share with you the projected student enrollment for next year. And so we're projecting 15,141 students, which is the number of students accounted for at the 60 day student enrollment count that coincides with the October FTE, which stands for that full time equivalent. It is this count that the state uses in its budget calculations for all school districts in the state. Taking all this into consideration, along with other factors, new subdivisions going in, those kinds of things, um, we are projecting a reduction in the number of students projected for the 24-25 school year. RCA, RCPS has seen a reduction in student population since COVID. We still have not gotten all of those students back. Uh, a lower number of students means that our staffing allotments will also reflect fewer teachers based on fewer students. Last year, the board approved 338 elementary school student teachers, 197 middle school teachers, and 251 high school teachers. So with that, tonight, the superintendent will recommend that the Rockdale County Board of Education approve the attached certified teacher allotments for the FY25 budget year as a minimum number of positions needed. This includes 330 elementary school teachers, 191 middle school teachers, 249 high school teachers. Just so you all know, this is a decrease of 16 teachers from the request from last year. The approval of uh, the rationale, the approval of the minimum certified staff positions or points is crucial to allow principals an adequate window for interviewing and securing quality personnel for the upcoming school year. The points plan includes flexibility staffing points, which are contingent upon funding from the budget process. Additionally, the superintendent will recommend that the Rockdale County Board of Education approve the attached special education and English language learner certified allotments for FY25 budget year as a minimum number of positions needed. This includes 82 elementary teachers, 116 secondary special education teachers, and 29 ELL teachers. This is the same number as last year with an increase at the elementary level and a decrease at the secondary level based on our current students and the I, their IEPs and what their needs are. The approval of the minimum certified staff and position staffing points is crucial to allow principals an adequate window for interview and securing quality personnel for the upcoming school year. And so that leads me to this. Congratulations. Um, the next two items are a direct relation to the recognition that the board won again, the Leading Edge Award um, for, for innovative solutions in the teacher shortage. Our first choice when hiring is always a full-time teacher with content knowledge of their subject. That's always our first choice. But we do need to give principals to continue to give them options. And so this is the survey results from this year from those principals who used Elevate K-12. And as you can see, they overwhelmingly are 100% um, of them that used that, liked it, um, and said that they would rather have Elevate rather than a substitute. They prefer someone with content knowledge. Um, so with that, um, the superintendent will recommend that the Rockdale County Board of Education approve the use of Elevate K-12 to supply hard to fill teaching positions during the 2024-25 school year. The renewal is contingent upon the approval of the contract by the superintendent and the general counsel. The approval of Elevate K-12 will allow students to receive instruction from a live teacher who is highly qualified for the upcoming school year. Due to the teacher shortage, positions such as science, math, and world languages have been more challenging to fill. RCPS will be allowed to collect the FTE for each student taught in this environment. The cost represented is based on 34 sections equaling six teachers. The cost of six teachers equals 588,600 using the average cost of a teacher, which is 98,100. 
principals using this resource would use their point allotment for the Elevate K-12 teacher position. The minimum of 509,817 not to exceed 836,917. And again, it's an option. And then Intelodge was the other innovative practice that we used. Um, again, we always survey our administrators. They all want to uh, bring back their current Intelodge teachers, which we have 20 in our district, and said that they would like to increase that number if they can't find someone locally in the United States. So with that, this um, action item is actually an addendum to our current three-year contract that we have with Intelodge. Um, the superintendent will recommend the Rockdale County Board of Education approve the use of Intelodge to supply hard to fill teaching positions during the 24-25 school year. The renewal, it's actually an add addendum, is contingent upon the approval of the contract by the superintendent general counsel. The approval of Intelodge will allow students to receive instruction from experienced educators that are highly qualified in their content areas. This supports the RCPS Strategic Plan Initiative 1A3, rec recruit beyond local areas to state, national, and international. Minimum is 168,000, that's for our 21 current teachers, not to exceed 248,000, which would allow our principals 10 additional teachers if they so need that opportunity as an option. And I know I talked fast and I gave you a lot of information, so I'm always available for questions. Three meetings and I'm not able to, yeah. <laughs> Um, for the teacher, the numbers that you gave us, the vacancies, the 21 inter international teachers, is that included in those numbers? No, the 21 international teachers, because we do have a contract to be able to keep them for three years. Okay. So those those certified, these certified positions don't include, the, those 21 teachers are all being renewed. Okay, and then not the international teachers, but the one before that, the contract that we're using as an option, are we seeing any price increases in that um, no, contract? We were, we were able to negotiate for with both Intelodge and Elevate K-12 to keep us at our current cost. So no price increase for either one. And same question, those that's not calculated into those numbers that we have vacancies for either, correct? Correct. Well, no, because we are going to try to hire somebody first. Okay, so those that's why you're using the term um, option yes, for the, both, yeah, both abso contracts. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Dr. Beck, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, go back to the slide where it says 100 day student enrollment count. Explain what the projected number of students, what, is, what are those terms so we, mean? So we projected for this school year, you'll see that that says school year 23-24. Yes. This year we projected 15,710. And currently at the 100-day count, we were at 15,107, which is 600 students less than projection. Oh, okay. So it... <laughs> Is there a reason why we don't have or we're not comparing um, exact numbers from the beginning of the school year or is that not the purpose or? So the 20, so if you want to go back and look at, we counted, we count students every 20 days officially yes. and we use um, Infinite Campus to do that. Mm -hmm. So you can go back in your folder and see how many kids we had at the 20 day count, the 60 day count, the 80 day count, and now the 100 day count. I'm still not answering your question because I can see. Well, I guess I'm, I'm 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 looking at I want to look at the numbers number of students we have at the hundred day count, but I want to be able to compare that with the exact with an exact number, not a guesstimate. Like it's going to give me an idea of how many students have we. I'm gonna say lost. Well, the number the hundred day count is a number of exact students. Yes but I don't have anything to compare it to because I have a projected number on this side. Well, if you, yeah, if you go into your folder, you can see that same information for every count, okay. not only for the whole district, but also by school and by school by grade level. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. 
And the next question, I see the student teacher ratio, is that an average? So that's that's an average for the, each level. But if you wanted to see that for each school by grade level, that's also in your folder. There's a way more information in your folder on that student okay. enrollment count. Thank you very much. I, I, I was just wondering. I know I, you're a numbers girl. I, I am, <laughs> and I'm thinking when I see 20 to 1, I'm thinking I know about, I know a few people who have more than stu 20 students in their classes right oh, here absolutely. in Rockdale. So, well, and there's yeah. a lot that have a lot fewer than that. Yeah, but those are averages. It's an, it's an average teacher to student ratio. Exactly. I get it. Correct. Thank you very much. I get it. You're, you're very welcome. Dr. Beck, I have a few questions. Absolutely. Um, Elevate K-12 and Entelage, there was administrator feedback, but has the district been getting feedback from students? We have been getting feedback from, from students. Last year when we shared this with you, we actually had student videos up for you all to view. Um, and when you we've been getting those through walkthroughs that Ms. Chesser's group does, we've been going in and observing those classrooms and all of those students, all of those classrooms are functioning the way as expected. Do we have any data and if any of them take milestones or um, do we have any data showing how students that are taught by Elevate K-12 and Entelage compare with a traditional class taught by a traditional teacher? Yeah, and last year we did share that data with you and those kids taught by those teachers were doing as well as the, the other students. Obviously in February, I don't have that kind of data for you because their students are not taking those exams just okay. yet. But I'll be glad once we do have that data to come back and share that with you. Thank you. Absolutely. And Kim, uh, those are all good questions, but in terms, of, in terms of the specific uh, uh, human resources innovation, I know that we've been very, our preference and our practice uh, have been to steer clear of tested subjects absolutely for the use of yes. these. So you may want to share that. Yeah, that's that's a, yeah. So tested subject areas, we try not to have an elevate. Yeah, state testing. We try not to have an elevate teacher in those classrooms. Okay. Um, just because you know we want to make sure that that's as level playing field as we can. And again, optionally, our first choice is always that in person teacher. But our second choice is always content based teacher with Georgia certification, which all of these teachers have. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So we have the elevate teacher that the, and that's the virtual teacher. Yes, ma'am. So we have elevated teachers and then we have other teachers that call out ask how does that impact the other teachers? Well, for elevate, it does it because they provide their own substitutes. So if an Elevate teacher is not going to be there, then another Elevate teacher steps in and teaches that class. Right, but I'm just saying we have teachers, we have classes that have human teachers, and if those human teachers call out, but you don't have that teacher in the Elevate class, how is that affecting the other teachers? I know if, I'm not saying the Elevate teacher call out. I'm saying if other staffers call out, how are we covering the well, classroom? You well, know, usually, you know, I know a lot of teachers, uh, well, you come to my classroom because this teacher, I don't have a substitute to cover that. So how is that impounding everything when you have the elevate teachers? And it doesn't. Okay. It doesn't. It doesn't impact it at all. So our teachers are not overwhelmed with having maybe two classes inside of one. Or not. Not. Classes. Not due to elevate. No, ma'am. No, I'm not saying elevate. So the elevate classroom has a para pro in that class, but I see what you're saying. If it, if I'm a second grade teacher and I call out because my kid's sick and I can't find a sub, how does that affect? So the principal then is, you know, we obviously we try to find a substitute, but then principal, it's up to the principal to decide how they're going to best serve those kids. They can sometimes pull another staff member from within the building. Um, they they could separate those kids and put them into different classrooms, but that's a principal decision. To follow up on that, is anybody keeping track of how often that happens? At the Absolutely. School? So I we keep track of what we call fill rates. Um, and we've been working with a company and it's called Red Rover. All teachers have it. All, all substitutes have it. Um, we've been working on trying to clean up that data, but that's definitely something that I can provide to Dr. Oates if you're interested in what our fill rates are. Yes. And then we can continue to work on that. Yes, thank you very much. And, and I want to commend you, Kim, because I know in the past you've shared fill rate I have. in the information that's been provided to the board. Yeah, right. so I can definitely do that for your next um, board briefing. One more question before you go. Absolutely. Um, 
Are you keeping, um, are you able to tell me if we're using more of those, um, whether Elevate or in um, the international teachers at the elementary level, middle school level, or um, at the high school level, where are we seeing the greatest need for that, or it's not constant? Elevate is mostly high school okay. and some middle school, um, and the international teachers are, they're across the board. They're across the board. Yeah, okay. because they're in person. Any other questions for me? Have the interlocks to teachers. Salem, Rockdale, Honey Creek, Edwards, and Conyers all have the international teachers. And then, no, not currently. And then the Elevate program is currently at RCA, Salem, Rockdale, Edwards, and Conyers. Kim, was, was this information part of your presentation? Where the where the it was in my notes. Within your notes, okay. Okay, okay. I just wanted to make sure. I was going to say, let's get. I can get that to the movie. Yeah, sure. it was in my notes. But it's in there. Okay, great, yeah. great. Okay, thank you. Philip. Good evening, Madam Chair Brown, Vice Chair Duncan, board members, Superintendent Dr. Oates. I have several action items tonight to bring to you consideration. The first one is the Memor Memorandum of Understanding for the City of Conyers and Rodney County Board of Education. We've done this for the last several years with the city. The superintendent will recommend that the Rockdale Board of Education approve the memorandum of agreement between the City of Conyers and Rockdale County Board of Education for the City of Conyers to use our property located at 960 Pine Street here on this campus for the Red, White, and Boom Independence Day celebration. Uh, this has been reviewed by our superintendent and our general counsel, and this uh, the rationale is that this gives them the opportunity to use our facility for their for the July 4th celebration on July 3rd. The second one is the um, architect for the Magnet School and Epic re-roofing. The superintendent will recommend that the Rockdale Board of Education approve Raymond Engineering George Inc. as the architect for the Rockdale Magnet School and Epic re-roofing projects. The scope of the, both these projects, participation in the selection of the construction company or companies, the quality assurance inspections during the re-roofing projects and the sign off on the completed projects are included in this project work by the architect. The cost of the architectural services will be calculated from architect engineering fee schedule, which is attached to your uh, action item. The Rodale Magnus School and Epic Roofs are aged and do major renovation and replacement. At the Magnus School, our goal is to replace this, the current shingle roofing with metal roofing. At Epic, we'll take the foam roofing away and replace it with TPO. Uh, the e plus e, this uh, funding will be paid by the East Plus 5 funding from that fee schedule. The Epic Water Wastewater Treatment Plant Improvement Project. Uh, the superintendent will recommend that the Rockdale Board of Education approve the selection of Rehab Construction Company Inc. for the Epic Wastewater Treatment Plant Improvement Project. Proposal number 202-40109, quote, 1125 for $85,000, and this was submitted on January 9th. This will be a turnkey construction project. We have construction companies, a licensed util utility company for the state of Georgia. Our uh, campus wastewater treatment plant is in uh, needs to have the improvement of, uh, for the flow requirements. It's not meeting those right now. That's requiring extensive work on this plant and we got to be ready for next school year. And this is just for the current uh, population that we currently have out there with our um, open campus and Alpha stu students and our RVC from the high school level. The construction scope of work performed will meet the flow schematic requirements drawn up by architect Carter and Scoop. The uh, work is scheduled to be completed before the start of the coming school year. It's $85,000 from East Bloss 5 and the last time we worked on this was back in 2003. We did some major work on it, and this will get us through temporarily, but until we can come up with a better design that they're working currently on. 
paint contracts. Lorraine Elementary School, Superintendent recommend that the Rockdale County Board of Education approve the selection of A&D Painting, Inc. as a contractor choice from bids submitted February 2nd in the amount of $52,000 for the Lorraine, Lorraine Elementary School repainting project. A&D Painting, Inc. provided the lowest bid for this project, and this is contingent upon the approval of the Superintendent General Council. I would say A&D have painted for us the last couple summers and done an outstanding job. The scope of the project involves repainting the interior and exterior of Lorraine as needed and to maintain the seven year cycle of repainting each of our schools. $52,000 from East Lost Five. And then the paint contract for Pine Street Elementary School. A&D also is the one who was the lowest bidder for this project. Uh, $94,500 for this repaint at uh, Pine Street. The rationale is slightly different. The scope of the project involves the repainting of the school interior and exterior. Uh, this is the first repainting of Pine Street Elementary School since its construction. The time frame is five years. And considering the type of materials uh, used in this construction and the district's high volume use for teaching and learning and other professional development at this location, the repaint time cycle was reduced from our normal seven year cycle to this five year cycle. Likewise, we've done the same thing with uh, RCA over the years that it's been in service, and we anticipate doing that with JH House when this turn comes. $94,500 from East Blast 5. This concludes my action items for this month. Any questions? Thank you so much. Have a good evening. I'm actually going to stand. I've been sitting too long, so thank you. I'm good. All right. Good evening, everyone. Chairwoman Brown, Vice Chair Duncan, board members and guests, your favorite presentation, our strategic plan update. Take a good stretch. Yes, I think everybody needs a good stretch. All right, we're just going to start off um, right at the beginning. You know, where did we start? And that was with the development of our 2022 to 27, our five year strategic plan. And you can see we have our, um, actually, we have it in the wall over here and we have it in all of our schools. In this particular poster, we actually have in all of our classrooms as well. And this is a reminder to all of our staff um, what our mission is, our vision, what our goals are, and our performance objectives. Um, just to recap, again, we have phase one um, was the year, tw the school year 22-23 and 23-24. Um, and then we'll transition next year into phase two action items. Although I will tell you that you'll start to see some artifacts and evidence in some of the phase two um, plans. And that really has to do with, you know, if, if we're able to start things, we'll go ahead and get them started. So, um, that's the you, the great thing about a strategic plan that is a living document is you have to have that fluidity. So it, you know it could be based on resources or timing, or you may want to delay something a little because you've got you know ten other new things going on, or you may want to go ahead and start something because of the timing. So um, so again, you'll start to see some artifacts and evidence for some of the phase two things, but not all of them. We will do a periodic review with our action teams. Um, uh, later this second semester, um, and then we'll probably bring our original strategic planning team back in August because then we will have also um, had one whole year of our performance measures and we can go over that with that team as well. So where is our strategic plan? Um, where do you get to it? General public can get to it. Everybody can get to it. It's easy on our website. If you go to the about tab, you can see right there um, strategic plan. You click on that and it takes you to Simbly, which is the board site. And in Simbly, um, it's in kind of in layers. And so this is the GSBA format that we chose to use. And you can click on any one of these and everything that I tell you tonight is on our website. It's already there. We've updated it. And then everything I told you in September, the updates I did in September, you'll see them there as well. So we keep that running tab on the website um, of the artifacts and evidence. So it's all very easy to find. So we will just dive right in. And what I'm going to do um, um, 
in September, what I did is I left the slides in that had um, artifacts and evidence from the previous update. But for the sake of time and um, just your energy of reading this stuff, I took out those slides. Again, they are on the website um, and then we can always reference back. But I took there were some some of these action plans that had five and six slides of stuff we've already talked about. So we'll skip over that. So human resources and talent development, that is our first goal area, our first action plan to provide incentives to enhance district recruiting. And again, I'm highlighting what's new and the, all of this stuff is really from um, first semester. So say some of it you'll see in here from spring because when I did the update in September, it really encompassed um, last spring. So most of this is going to be either a late spring, summer, or um, fall update, okay? As you know, we had the um, $1,000 retention um, that Governor Kemp provided to some employees to supplement, and Rockdale County Public Schools chose to give that to all employees. Then um, networking with local colleges. You can see we network with Clayton State and Georgia Southern. Uh, Georgia State University, Tennessee State University, Georgia College and State University. Again, this is all to increase awareness of what our opportunities are here. Recruiting beyond the local area to state, national and international audiences. You can see we are recruiting um, locally, Gwinnett College, Atlanta University Center Con Consortium, all around the metro Atlanta, and then when you go beyond to um, other parts of the state, Dalton State College, University of Georgia, Mercer, Middle Georgia State University, Kennesaw, West Georgia, Valdosta, so really recruiting all around the state. Um, and then beyond Georgia to places like University of Alabama, Carolina A&T University, Tennessee State, Troy, Auburn, South Carolina, and Alabama A&M University. Um, and then also recruiting at conferences. Conferences are a great place um, for the specialized um, teaching positions as well. Moving on, this is a phase two, um, retaining and developing certified employees. Um, but you can see there's a lot of action that um, has already happened under this. A lot of this is all about, actually all of this is about professional development. Um, and in our district, we have a lot of professional development that happens year round. So um, I'm not going to read through this. There are two slides of artifacts and evidence all um, about professional learning for different different teaching groups um, and you know, highlighting the Professional Learning Institute that had over 200 um, sessions and those are on our independent learning day. So making use of those and the teacher work day in January. Again, here's the second slide on retaining and developing certified employees with more information about um, professional learning opportunities. New teacher orientation provided in October to teachers that were hired after the start of the school year. That's a new um, practice of ours. Customer service training you'll see here. Um, cultural sensitivity training, and then also um, the endorsement courses that you've heard about um, from our departments. Um, also, uh, retaining and develop classified employees is under our human resources and talent development. Um, a lot of uh, professional learning for our classified employees lately. Um, again, a lot of this is summer into uh, first semester pair of professional training. A lot happened during pre-planning um, and then also on those independent learning days as well. Learning support pair professionals attended an orientation on board policy JGF, and that's the seclusion or restraint of students that happened in September. And then our office employees participated in customer service training. Um, it actually, customer service training 101, but we actually just finished 102. Um, that didn't make it on here um, when this slide was due, but we did just complete customer service training 102. Provide training for all leaders in the area of inclusive leadership, cultural proficiency, employee recognition, and employee appreciation. Again, on this slide, what's new is um, 29 of our RCPS leaders participated in a leadership book study. And the book was Unreasonable Hospitality, The Remarkable Power of Giving People More Than They Expect. A lot of professional learning. And you'll actually see a lot of professional learning under this next category as well, student learning achievement and growth. 
implementing a district-wide comprehensive instructional effectiveness plan that addresses the essential components of instructional planning, delivery assessment, and response using the RCPS cycle for results. And I know our teaching and learning division reports um, somebody every meeting. So you have heard all of this information um, along the way from our teaching and learning experts. I'm not the expert, but I'm here to put it in the context of our strategic plan. So we have two slides of artifacts and evidence um, up under this category. Um, you heard Dr. Meng just talk about the lead guitar program. And um, let's see, then we have developing common unit assessments for grades six through 12 in social studies, introducing and collaborating with leaders on analyzing the quality assurance rubric to determine instructional priorities and indicators for new math standards. We've heard a lot about the new math standards. Um, and a lot of professional learning that goes along with that as well. The second slide of artifacts and evidence under this um, action plan, science teacher cohorts engaged in the ongoing performance task development and implementation. Um, you'll Again, you see the lead guitar edition. Um, balanced assessment system, assessment system has been reviewed and revised to ensure accurate tracking of student achievement um, Enhanced focus walk instrument and then enhanced RCPS data protocol to provide structured and systematic approach to collecting and analyzing student data. Modifying the RCPS collaborative coaching plan to increase teacher effectiveness. What's new in this one is that all our new district and school based coaches are enrolled in the coaching endorsement this school year. The next two slides, I know Beth Gillis has talked to you. Um, you know, recently um, she's been in front of you a couple of times talking to talking to you about this, the advanced academics. Um, this is implementing a K-12 comprehensive advanced academics plan for gifted and high achieving students. Some of the things that I know we've talked about, um, the elementary gifted showcase that was held at RCA. All high schools, um, and Dr. Meng just mentioned this, all high schools nominated fine arts students for the Governor's Honors Program. The AVID showcase held in um, October, attended by our RCPS AVID teachers. Two advanced academic information nights were held for parents. Um, and the Torrance test for creative thinking training for all of our gifted leaders. Increased gifted eligibility numbers over the past two years. I know she talked about that quite a bit. And then you also see some more um, artifacts and evidence under this action plan, providing students with learning experiences in all courses and content areas. Sorry, that's spam. Um, in all co courses and content areas to aid and accelerate the learning process. Um, some of the artifacts and evidence under here are implementation of the Elite Academy. I know Ms. Gil um, Gillis had talked about that during the summer months. The approval of three new AP courses the full implementation of project-based learning units in grades three through five, increase opportunities for students to participate and perform beyond the school in fine arts. We just heard about that. We are partnering with um, the Car Conyers Rockdale Council for the Arts to bring the production Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad to all fourth grade students. That was last um, spring partnering with Rockdale 4-H to enhance learning opportunities. And then also um, we heard from Mr. Kelichek, we are also partnering with the Rockdale County Soil and Water Conservation District to offer RCPS students experiences. And then also the city of Conyers to bring the Conyers essay contest to all 12th graders um, attending Rockdale County High School and RCA within the city limits. Here's another phase two that's starting to um, kind of take hold and get some artifacts and evidence. And this is foster learning environments that empower students toward a successful post-secondary pathway. Some of the artifacts and evidence under here, industry certification opportunities for all high school pathway completers. And um, we heard uh, Ms. Jonagan talk about the profile of the graduate that was developed and shared with stakeholders as well. Another phase two that has taken some traction, providing additional world language course offerings to students. Conyers Middle School added Spanish two courses. Heritage High School offered it um, advanced placement in Italian. Um, and then you'll see the world language team is working with um, Elevate. You just heard from 
um, Dr. Back to design exploratory Spanish courses for grades six and seven. So, you know, taking traction in our world language course offerings for students. Uh, expanding and revising pathways based on economic trends and student interests. Um, law and public safety and career skills courses have been added at Conyers Middle School. Marketing and management pathway added at RCA. Welding, manufacturing, culinary, and early childhood education labs have been updated and or expanded at Rockdale Career Academy. And the updated, um, the AV film and tech lab has equipment at Salem has been updated. So again, keeping all of that relevant for our students to learn um, what is current and relevant to the workplace. Preparing every student to be productive and thriving members of our global society. Um, this is uh, one that also has a lot of artifacts and evidence on previous slides if you go into the, into the website to see that. But again, talking about the profile of the graduate, social studies and CTAE pathway, public management and administration um, began at Salem High School. We talked about, um, we had Bernalisa here talking about voter registration drives, again, partnering with the city and um, secondary schools being encouraged to hold their own science fairs prior to the district science fair. Elementary schools are encouraged to participate in the science Olympiad. And then high school theater programs, um, we also heard from Dr. Meng, will participate in the Poetry Out Loud. That was on one of her lists as well. Implementing evidence-based practices to promote students to become assessment-capable learners. Again, this is a phase two that has just started um, taking traction and um, providing some evidence and artifacts there. Again, this is um, focusing on um, professional learning opportunities for teachers. There were develop there were developing assessment capable learners was the training um, that was held in September and October during our professional learning days. And then in October, all our district curriculum coaches, school based academic coaches and digital learning specialists participated in a half day training. And then teachers received training on the student interface with the assessment platform. All right, moving on to develop and implement a comprehensive birth to 12th grade literacy plan. And I can tell you this is another one that probably has five or six slides of artifacts and evidence. But um, we've heard a lot about um, from Ms. Chester's department on the dyslexia endorsement um, and then also in the screeners um, and then all of the letters and training and the literacy pathways. Um, all of that is artifacts and evidence that falls up under this uh, particular action plan. The next action plan actually has six slides of artifacts and evidence, and I'm not going to read them to you, but um, the reason it has six is because the action plan is improve instructional practices and strategies in all courses and content areas. So when we're talking about all courses and content areas, you're going to see artifacts and evidence from the different content areas. Um, so there's a lot in here. Um, you will see uh, artifacts and evidence from science endorsement courses. Again, letters is in here. Um, science is a verb. I know I always hear um, Dr. Richards, Dr. Richardson say that. Um, science teachers engaged in professional learning. Again, this is where you're going to see a lot of professional learning happen. Um, professional learning for all fine arts teachers um, is another one, uh, which we heard Dr. Ming talk about. Uh, math and the new math standards, a lot of um, professional learning regarding the vertical alignment of standards for K2 and 3-5 math teachers. Um, professional learning on deconstructing standards and creating learning targets and success criteria for math teachers on those new math standards. A lot of professional learning under this one. You'll see for the um, social studies in here, um, targeted professional learning opportunities for social studies. Again, provided uh, literacy integra in integration training through social studies. Um, and then content training for personal finance and economics teachers, US history training. All of that is falling up under improving our instructional practices and strategies. 
You will also see in here the redesigned focus walk instrument that is now being used to provide that targeted feedback to our schools and our district leaders, and also the enhanced RCPS data protocol to improve our um, data informed conversations. Again, the last one um, kind of goes back. There's a lot of math on this one as well. This is the last slide of artifacts and evidence. Um, and you'll see here we are partnering with Metro RESA and with the Georgia Department of Education to also provide training in these areas. Community, family, and student engagement is our next goal area. And let me just um, say that we you are not always going to see artifacts and evidence under every single action plan every time I report and you know so it's kind of an ebb and flow sometimes you know you see movement a little more in some areas and not some others so if you're wondering you know if there's something missing that maybe I reported on in September it may just be that there wasn't a lot of traction this particular fall semester so review and revise all necessary I mean as necessary all school and district websites um, I think I mentioned to you last time um, how we were developing that timeline well, we have since reviewed product demos from Aptigy, Final Sight, Parent Square, School Messenger, and Edlio, which are the top um, providers of school websites. And then, um, so we haven't made any decisions yet. We do have a team looking at this, um, but we did look at, we've had demos from all of those product, um, from all of those companies, and uh, we'll make decisions fairly soon on how we're going to move forward. Um, a lot of times these companies are buying out other companies, so that we kind of are in the middle of some of that happening as well with communication um, tools. And so it may slow us down a little bit in making changes, and that just really has to do with some of these companies are purchasing other companies. It puts us in a kind of an awkward position with contracts. And so um, it, like for instance, Parent Square just bought Remind. Well, we have a Remind contract, but we're not a Parent Square contract so it just you know we just have to kind of uh, time it a little bit um, differently than maybe we planned and then our customer service um, independent audit of our websites um, gave us a positive re review so I did want to share that so I don't I don't feel like we should be in a hurry to just turn them all off tomorrow because um, the feedback you know was we're okay until we make decisions on where what direction we're going to go um, create the style guide and communication uh, training programs. The style guide is something that kind of tells people, you know, how you should use the logo, what colors and fonts and things like that. There's there's a lot more information in that. And the holdup we had on that was something that actually came out as a recommendation in that customer service audit as well. And that is um, and uh, standardizing our email signatures throughout the district because um, everybody kind of has a different you know, way they put their email signature. Um, and so we have finally figured out how to do that with an email template that everybody can use. And we are going to um, publish that for the upcoming school year. Improving communication with stakeholders without children in the district. Again, we continued with the front porch discussions. Um, and then also the East Plus Six presentations to homeowners associations, civic clubs, and then most recently the economic development breakfast. Expanding access to extracurricular activities. This is an area that our assistant superintendents have been working on to make sure, again, that what is offered, you know, in one school, it's offered in another so that we are equitable across the district in what we're offering our students and what they have um, to choose from is really what, you know, they have an interest in, right? So, um, moving in the direction of just really taking a close look at that. We know that the research says that students who are engaged in extracurricular activities have fewer discipline infractions. So that's an area that um, we want to look closely at and see how we can expand those offerings to our students and then also get more students, you know, engaged in those. Um, and I, so I'll just skip to the high school um, level right here because um, they really have made some changes 
with how they're going to track. That's been an issue. How do you track how many kids are actually engaged in extracurriculars? Um, and so, you know, they're going to do a uh, school-wide roster inventory of clubs and um, teams and start that baseline so that we can start tracking that a little bit better. And then, you know, hopefully if we know exactly you know who the what the numbers are and and um, where we need to maybe you know encourage more students to participate right or increase the offerings um, and just make sure that our students have that access and are aware of what's available to them um, and I don't want to just make um, I don't want to sound like it's all athletics or band because um, we do have a lot of academic competitions that we offer as well. Um, and so all of the high schools are using and, and um, have shared that academic extracurricular competition calendar as well. Um, all of our schools uh, and programs pr provided school-wide club fair with awareness and activities um, that are available to our students. And then the counselors have also um, started including a question and discussion about extracurriculars during their one-on-one -on -one advisement meetings. So I'm excited about that one. Improving parental attendance and involvement in school activities and workshops. Um, and, and this one, um, and again, you, you, you kind of have to also look at sometimes the action steps that go along with these. But um, this, this particular one really talked about keeping those hybrid options for parents. And, and we know, you know, we went virtual during COVID, but we have to remember that, high, I mean, a virtual option for some parents who are working might be a better option even outside of COVID. So we're trying to keep that hybrid option available as, as much as possible um, in, a, in as many ways as, as we can. And then also leveraging our social media to um, also, you know, attract parents to get involved and also, um, make sure that they're aware of what's happening in their schools. The two-way conversations through Remind that can happen um, with our teachers um, is invaluable. The, uh, I can tell you from what I hear our teachers say about Remind and being able to use that tool um, to talk to parents and get them engaged in their students' learning through that platform. Um, we, we've had a lot of conversations about Remind. It would be a difficult change if we wanted to change from Remind. And then um, incentives are provided, you know, when they're available for parents to attend. So they're looking at all of that at all the levels. Um, increasing parent voice. Um, all schools, you know, have school councils. And again, this is kind of going back and making sure that all of the schools are, you know, putting, using their school councils, their PTAs, PTOs, and then they all have principal-led discussions that are formal and informal. Not just one school here and one school there, but across the board. Positive culture and climate. We're going to dive right into enhancing various multi-tiered systems of support or MTSS. Along with that goes RTI, which re is response to intervention. And you can see that training was provided um, at the beginning of this school year as well. Providing safe and orderly procedural trainings throughout the year. Um, and this is for the district and the local schools. Again, adding on this particular um, artifacts and evidence of the behavior threat assessment training that happened. It was sponsored by GEMA and then the Narcan certification for all of the Office of School Safety Personnel. Installing safety measures on all campuses, um, not really new, but it's ongoing. The upgrade of the um, stadium cam cameras from IP to digital, and you'll see that in the next slide as well, installing safety measures um, and talking about the digital cameras approved to fill all of the DVR bases um, and that the 830 digital cameras um, are on track to be installed by July 2024. Creating an orientation process for new and returning students. Again, this is looking at, you know, really um, the process. How, how are our students being introduced to the school, whether they're new or even if they come after the beginning of the school year? You know, are, are, are we welcoming them and are we showing them around the school and taking them on tours? And so our assistant superintendents are really looking at this process to be standard across our schools and how we um, orient students, particularly um, providing those transition processes, you know, the middle, the elementary to the middle and the middle to the high. Um, but then again, looking at um, that 
process for orienting students who may be new to our district and new to the school. Enhancing the school classroom physical environment. Um, and again, we're always trying to do that through updates and in um, I will just point out here the positive learning environment assessment and feedback included on the focus walks. This is the third time we've seen that um, come up. So again, making sure that um, you know we're inspecting what we expect. Operational effectiveness and efficiency. Um, this first one talks about being, this is the last goal by the way, um, talks about being fiscally responsible. I know Mr. Hall talks about um, finances every month with you, but in the context of the strategic plan, increasing that number of gifted students and EIP students increases our FTEs, which increases funding. You all know that. Um, we have all employees now on uh, direct deposit and um, they are reviewing the software to help with the transition to the bi-monthly payroll. Improving transportation services. I know Mr. Budensik has talked a lot about this recently, the new buses that are coming on board, and I won't go through. You can see the numbers here of, of buses that have been ordered and the ones that we expect um, to be with us very soon. Ensuring students have equitable access to modern learning environments that meet programmatic needs. Um, a lot of work here again. This is under Mr. Budensik's um, area and you can see the whole list is kind of you know zigzags the district right to make sure that everybody has what they need um, and that the programs have what they need as well. Improving the curb appeal of all schools. Um, this is something that uh, again you know there are things that happen periodically like the pine straw you see in the list you know that's going to happen twice a year to improve that curb appeal. But one of the things that um, we're doing is taking a step with an architect to review and recommend curb appeal options and the priorities for all school sites. Improving the cleanliness and, the, uh, and safety of facilities. I know Mr. Budensik had talked about the long list of projects um, that were um, taken care of over the holiday break. Providing, uh, and so now we're into our final uh, performance objective of ensuring a robust, secure, and resilient technology infrastructure. So we've had Derek Fort talk to us about the um, securing that digital environment and the importance of that we've seen through our neighbors. And you just have to watch the news and you know about the importance of um, securing our digital environment. Enhancing that technology and infrastructure, you know, as um, our technology changes, so does the infrastructure that um, has to carry that technology. So we are um, very blessed to have a technology department that stays on top of all the this stuff and keeps us moving forward. Standardizing and modernizing classroom technology equipment. Again, this is this one is an ongoing. It's all about keeping our students with the tools that they need. Um, and you know, technology gets outdated very quickly. So this year it was our iPads um, for our pre-K to first grade students that got refreshed. That is our strategic plan update in a nutshell. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you. Your favorite update. <laughs> <laughs> You forgot. Yeah. Feel free to email me. Call me. All right, I'll wake y'all up. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair Brown, Madam Vice Chair Duncan, Dr. Rose board members. I'll be going over the preliminary financial report for January. All right, the revenue for uh, January is 11.8 million. The revenue. Okay. You, you click for me. Revenue year to date is 147.5 million, which is 73.7% .7 of our budget. Uh, last January we received 10.9 million, 131.8 million year to date, which was 72.8% of our budget. Uh, expenditures for January 19 million. That's high because of our bonus that we paid out. Uh, year to date, 122.6 billion, which is 59.8% of our budget. Uh, last January, we, we expended 15.5, 107.4 million year to date, which was 58.2% of our budget. 
Outstanding encumbrances, $1,764,089. Our fund balance uh, at the end of January is probably 61.2 million. Last year, we were about 63 million. Assets, uh, 69.9 million. Liabilities, 3.7, which are third party payments. They'll be cleared out. And then fund balance is 61.2. Any questions? I think I have a question. Sure. Um, you mentioned the bonuses. Yes. Is that the bonus that the governor promised? That's the retention bonus. Retention we paid bonus. that out. In, uh, so that was not originally in our budget, right? No, if you look at note five, I put a note in there about note five. So that's why we're a little over budget because note three, four, and five address all those items that were not budgeted. Okay. Will we be re refunded from the state? We did. They did fund part of it, but since we paid all of it out, we were like eight almost 7,000, 700 something thousand that we had to pay out of our out of balance. balance to okay. go. Okay, all right. Right. We got to talk. Correct. Yes. Very good. Yeah, and, and Keith, what I would say is that the state identified, as you know, right. what certified positions, full-time positions were included. And so it did include beyond teachers, but it didn't cover all of our right. uh, full-time employees. That's right. And, right. It, it, and it, we it, made that commitment to do yeah, that. Yeah, correct. Right. Thank you. Madam Chairwoman, I don't have any superintendent's update. I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The cabinet has provided numerous presentations. Uh, I would like to ask the board to please review that information. And would would you all like to take a recess at this time? I know it's been a long time. Y'all hanging in there? Thank you very much. We'll move. We'll move right on. Please review the January 2024 board minutes and provide any edits to Ingrid. We will vote on those minutes at the regular session. There is no old business. There is no new business. The cabinet has provided an overview of the action items one through 10 for the board to vote on next week. Is there a motion for the action items to be placed on a consent agenda? Madam Chair, I move that the items be placed on the agenda, uh, uh, on the agenda as consent items. Okay. How many? Is it one through ten? Can I get a second of motion? Please? Second, Sandra Jackson. Let's. Thank you, Sandra. Okay. Motion has been made by Keita Palmer, and second by Sandra Jackson. Let to add items one through ten to a consent agenda. Do we have any discussion? All in favor? Heather Duncan. Oh. Motion carries. Dr. Oates head is in the way. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, there is no board discussion. Do I hear a motion to go into executive session? So moved, Heather. Okay, a motion has been made by Ms. Duncan, second by Ms. Jones to go into executive session. Any discussion? All in favor? Heather, motion carries. I got you. Seven thirty-three, executive session. We'll go to the large conference room.
taste it though. I it's <laughs> Did he really make you crawl under there? Yeah, yeah. He said. I appreciate I appreciate y'all. So I'm good.
seven forty six p.m. and the board has come back into open session. Do I hear a motion to approve the superintendent's recommendation to appoint Ms. Gina Williams, retired elementary and middle school principal, as interim principal of Edwards Middle School, effective March the first, twenty twenty four. This appointment will go through the remainder of 2023-2024 school year. A motion has been made by Ms. Jones and a second by Ms. Duncan. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Do I hear a motion to conclude the meeting? So moved, Justin. Thank you. A motion by Justin. Kenny has been made to conclude the meeting and second by Ms. Duncan. All in favor? Motion carries.